All right, good uh, evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last uh, meeting of the Sustainable Communities Panel uh, in this term of the Council. <laughs> And I'd like to uh, firstly pay tribute to those colleagues who um, sadly won't be uh, restanding again. Uh, so that's on the call, that's Geraldine, Councillor Geraldine Stanford. In the room here, uh, Councillor Nick Draper, Councillor David Ward, and uh, substituting regularly um, on the panel, Councillor Ben Butler, um, all um, very, very valued uh, colleagues. Um, so this evening, I plan to take the um, agenda as red. Um, so that's starting off with obviously the usual business and then going on to the call in planning enforcement and then housing enforcement. And um, yeah, that's where we're going to start off. So um, are there any apologies reported? I don't believe so. Oh, sorry, of course. David, do you want to go? Thank you very much. Um, and that's just to clarify, it's because uh, Councillor Holden plans to speak on the uh, call in. Um, so, can we have any declarations of interest? No? Okay. Um, minutes from the previous meeting. Um, I've got one um, correction I believe needs making on page five. Uh, when there was a series of votes at the last meeting uh, relating to housing enforcement, and at the the way the minutes are read, um, it doesn't make clear that all the recommendations were passed with the exception of recommendation D. At the minute, they say the last two weren't carried when in fact they, they were. So um, I'd like to ask that will be amended in the, in the official record. Can I have a seconder? Thank you. And then we agree the minutes is read. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so, can we uh, take the uh, action log? I think we've got one one amber item relating to green space strategy, believed to come in um, in what's due by the end of the month. Um, have we had any update, Rosie, at all on that item? No. Nope. Okay. So I'll follow that up with officers. Um, there's a series of items there which are which are on the action log because they are they've been um, achieved and they're green and they'll be coming off the next meeting is there any questions on any items there no okay thank you uh next item performance monitoring um do, does off, any officer want to speak on the actual performance Excuse us, folks, while we just get the mics working. I'm turning off. We have action. Never been under such intense scrutiny, I think, <laughs> for the last 10 <laughs> seconds or so. Um, so, apologies for that. Um, Chris has his apologies. Um, I think John Bosley uh, for um, public space wanted to just um, feedback on some of those. From us, from our own part, in terms of sustainable communities, the only one I want to sort of point to um, really was around uh, planning performance, but Leslie will be taking through a paper on that independently as a separate item. And perhaps just to, to draw. Um, members' attention, um, one showing red in, in sustainable communities also is around rent reviews. During the period of COVID measures, um, there was an agreement that we wouldn't uh, undertake any rent reviews during that period. We will slowly, over the, the next financial year, start building that back up. But um, there is an affordability issue, which we'll be cognizant of as we do that. Um, but that's um, best now to hand over to John. Thank you, James. Um, Thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of, of the public space indicators, the, the, the primary one to, to update on is the 
um, indicator number CRP124, and that's a percentage street um, inquiries rectified within their specified time frame. Um, the service itself issued a service improvement notice to Veolia. Um, we have received a response from Veolia um, yesterday. Office is currently analyzing their response and, and there is a supporting action plan um, presented by Veolia, which we'd be happy to discuss at a later time, um, once agreed with officers and Veolia on the progress of that. And that will hopefully improve that outcome. Um, in terms of the uh, CRP 097, um, the percentage of household waste recycled, we've had a 2% increase uh, from December to January. So some improvement in terms of that overall value, which is positive to see. Um, the projected outturn for the year is at 42%. So moving in um, a positive direction as compared to the December rate. Um, and then a bit of good news would be if we look at leisure services, which is SP405. Um, we've had a, a larger than um, target activity within our leisure centers, and that shows the positive movement um, in the leisure centers with um, people returning with some confidence over that January period, which we thought would be a bit more depressed um, due to some of the impacts of the Omicron variant. So it was good to see that we had a positive outturn. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for officers? I think David, Anthony, take it as read. Uh, it's an aside, actually, rather than a specific question. It was um, a number of residents have said to me how well the council has cleaned up after the uh, the winds at, uh, a couple of weeks ago, clearly uh, taking away the old trees. There's still a lot of work to do in terms of uh, tarmacking and replacing trees, but they fully understand it's going to take a few more months. But I would say most residents thanked, asked me to thank the council for the work that they did. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Um, two quick points. The first one is on page 12, and it relates to the number of outdoor events in parks, which is still showing a huge number. So I'm assuming that the uh, stats aren't pulling through still. Um, and my, sec my actual question related to some of the items on pages 13 and 14, specifically the number of uh, minor planning applications determined within eight weeks seems to be relatively low and also the market share of the building control and I wondered if we could uh, get a little bit more detail on, on both of those figures please. Thank you I think the um, the issue with the with the, the number of events in in parks and um, I think that may be a typo but I, I appreciate you raising that at this forum. Um, who would be James would you mind ah, I, I didn't want to have any spoilers but uh Leslie, would you mind addressing the points that Anthony raised? Thank you. Yeah, so with regards to um, planning applications being processed within um, the timescales, um, we have actually unfortunately been recording them incorrectly um, going back so far as April, so far as I know. We're in the process of recalculating them at the moment. And they are coming out in, um, well, since September, certainly in all cases as a lot higher than we've been reporting them. So we've simply been picking up the wrong figure. So that's planning applications. I think the other one was market share building control. Um, again, I, I can only say it's probably 
probably down to um, our IT, but in the past, we were reporting a higher figure for building control market share than we actually had. We have a very small team at the moment within building control. And so we generally achieve about a third of the market. That's all that we can possibly achieve with the number of staff that we have. However, we are looking to do a complete review of building control. And we will be looking at um, how we can recover that because the, the downside is that lots of jobs get done by approved inspectors and the public then come to us to complain about those jobs. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you very much for that um, uh, candid answer. I, I mean, I, I think what would be probably most helpful is if once you and your team have come to a conclusion from your work, if you could write to myself and I can circulate it to colleagues. And in that way, we're, we're approaching this in the, with, with, with the most information to hand. Um, I'm sure we can make a lot of assumptions and, and questions, but um, I think um that may be the best way forward but thank you for for highlighting that um to us are there any uh geraldine oh sorry james go ahead it would just be helpful to qualify that um leslie's uh interim head of the the team and um, she's come in and there has been there's been a hiatus between um team members and there's been a different methodology undertaken in good faith by by members of the team so what um, we're doing is reverting back to the, the tried and tested method and that is where we've been able to uh, just do a double check and reassure ourselves that we're doing the correct methodology and that's um, demonstrated that the performance um, using that methodology which is the, the well-established one is, is showing better performance than um, uh, what, what was done in good faith but um, wasn't with the fully trained up members of the team during the interim period of managers. Thank you and no, I suspected it was as such but thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, Geraldine, you're on the line. Uh, do you have any questions at all? Uh, no, nothing to add, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we've got no further questions on any of the performance monitoring, um, I uh, would like to proceed to our next item, um, the call-in. Um, I believe uh, Councillor Williams is going to uh, kick off by speaking for two minutes, followed by uh, Councillor Holden. Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, you have all three hillside councillors here with our cumulative 73 plus years service. And I, I just say that because you don't see us here very often. You won't see us here again, I guess, either. Uh, but we, <laughs> well, you might be, yes, yeah, sorry. Not all three of us. Uh, my, my, my serious point is that we, we don't uh, routinely call in uh, items. Uh, and so uh, in this particular case, it's only been done after careful consideration of all the representations made to us once the report was published, um, which mirrored, mirrored our own reservations that you can see in the report on page 30. Both Alwyn and Compton Road residents approached us, making different comments of disappointment. And we've heard subsequently from Worcester Road, where there was very little participation in any of the consultations. Um, it's hard to track through uh, all the available material so to be clear, the only discussion tonight centers around clarity of aims and desired outcomes and consideration and evaluation of alternatives. So members, please keep in mind that originally both the 2017 and 2019 consultations were about extending the hours of operation of the CPZ to match roads in the town centre as residents find it hard to park close to their homes at night and at the weekend. So will these additional parking bays help that? Well, no, only in the daytime. Will replacing single yellow lines with double yellow lines help? No, they'll actually make it worse. Our role has, to, has been to try to facilitate an outcome that would satisfy a wider body of opinion, including several ideas agreed in a paper generated by the Wimbledon East Hillside Residents Association last summer that still carries general support. Officers seem to have plumped for an either or solution that few find fully attractive. 
frankly, after five years of trying, we have been uh, seeking to see if there's a compromise. For example, a more gradual or incremental approach to implementation, including perhaps a temporary traffic management order. If you agree that this decision could be tweaked, please ask the cabinet member to look at it again. Thank you. Uh, that was two minutes on the spot. Uh, uh, Daniel, and then what I plan to do is open the floor for any immediate questions. And then we've got a number of public speakers. Um, I give them the opportunity to speak again, the panel, another opportunity to ask them questions and then open up for general questions. We may direct that to anyone who we feel appropriate to answer. Daniel. Good evening, colleagues. Um, it's unusual to be sat on this side of the table tonight. Um, I'm here along with my two war colleagues uh, to ask that you call in and review the CPZ decision for the W2 zone. Um, we want to get a solution that helps reach a more acceptable and, and uh, compromise with the residents as a whole. Uh, we want to focus on the clarity of desired aims and outcomes and consideration of alternatives, as the other points were ruled invalid by the monitoring officer. Uh, we do not think that the council aims have been met by this decision. The council hasn't shown evidence for the increased demand in parking bays. As a whole entity, the W2 CPZ zone has a lot of parking space. It just happens that too many people want to park in Compton Road only. St Mary's and Lake Roads also regularly are rather empty. Uh, there's also the Willington School on Worcester Road, which makes use of minibuses and coaches and I've seen how when they are driving around with multiple shopping uh, uh, vans and delivery trucks, and then the bin lorries going through Compton Road, it becomes impassable. Compton Road will have even fewer passing places under these proposals by officers. Uh, the proposed changes would result in creating the same problem that Compton has on, on Alwyn Road. Throughout, we have sought to facilitate the wishes of all the residents in the zone, and we encourage local residents uh, association were to create as wide an acceptable consensus as possible. They did just that and sent in a report to the officers to consider. The officers wouldn't consider this other alternative. On page 91, you'll see a table of the parking bays. We welcome that more existing shared use bays will become resident permits only. But an alternative that is missing is the P&D bays and shared use bays, which could very easily have been converted to residential thus satisfying the desire of local residents to park in their own roads. There is a very large nearby St George's Road car park where pay and display users could actually park and drive instead. I ask you to listen to the views that are expressed tonight by us and the next speakers and recommend some tweaks to the cabinet member. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so just gonna pause there. And does the panel have any immediate questions or any immediate comments on what they've heard at all? Uh, so we've got David and then Anthony, David. Just really one is, um, in all the correspondence you've had over the years, has a large group of people come to you with a specific solution or has nobody really come to you at all on this? Right, so last year we spoke to the residents about this decision that was being proposed and we said to them, go away, create your own little working group. And they did, they spent this summer and the early autumn putting together uh, plans and ideas that will be acceptable. Um, and they wrote this report and sent it in to officers to consider. Uh, this had the consensus view of residents in all the roads affected, um, but this was just dismissed out of hand by officers. And so it was essentially to change some of those pain display bays, uh, some of those shared use bays to residential only. Um, it was to keep the um, status quo on Alwyn regarding the single yellow line on the north edge of Alwyn Road. Uh, they were the two main points and they had some other uh, tweaks and suggestions as well. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to David and Dan for the presentation. Um, I've got two quick questions. The first one is, I wonder if I could take you to page 81, at the bottom of page 81. In one of the earlier um, consultations, there's a summary of ward councillor views, um, as there is 
uh, are welcome to the plans to create resident only parking bays and would like these to be as extensive as possible. And I wondered if that was an accurate summary. Um, that's that's my sort of first question. My second question is, um, there's some talk in the presentation of, of alternatives um, to the to the outcome to the decision, and I wondered if you could encapsulate for me what what the problem on these roads is that that is a solution to. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so in terms of that comment uh, in the report on page 81, that was regarding at the time um, the idea of converting the existing bays that were shared use into resident only. Um, and, and that's what we meant by this comment. At the time, it wasn't even on the table to change a uh, single yellow line into more bays. Uh, in fact, uh, somewhere in the report, it often said anything like that wasn't even possible. Um, so that's what that was regarding. And the other point, David Collins said. Sorry, would you repeat the second question? Sure, yeah, no problem. Um, obviously, your, uh, t tonight you would like ultimately us to refer this back to the decision maker because there is an alternative on the table and that alternative presumably is solving a specific problem, um, which the decision is also to be supposed to be solving a specific problem as well. And I wondered if you could encapsulate for me what, what the problem is that the alternative will solve. Right. Well, of course, the original problem was not being able to park at the evenings and weekends. Um, and the uh, clearly, if if bays went in, those would be available to be used for parking. Um, and in some instances, um, those bays would be put in front of properties who have illegal crossovers. And we don't we don't particularly quarrel with that as a concept. Um, however, uh, it, it is the, the loss of the single yellow line that, that worries us, because uh, clearly with the single yellow line, anybody, including the residents, uh, can park um, in the evening and, and at the weekends. If you actually put in a double yellow line, uh, it, it, it prevents both the residents and anybody else from, from parking there. So it will, as I said in my, my remarks, actually make it worse. Okay, is there any further question, Nigel? Thank you, um, Chair. Yeah. Right, um, I've been um, thinking on, um, you know, both, both um, sides of of um four and um uh, uh, again and and um and um thinking thinking in the uh, long um term if if it if it um if, if it um went um and some more treats were were made but um. Do, do you uh, think it, it will um, happen uh, again in in the uh, next um, two years? Yes, um, time because because the um I, I know the con 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 fashion have been um going on for for the last um. Five, five uh, years, and um, it seems that it's not, not um, not season a uh, time to um draw a, 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 a line. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor Bembo. Um, normally, with traffic management decisions, once the decisions being made, then uh, normally it doesn't get reviewed by the council or the cabinet member for a number of years. Uh, this this zone is one of the oldest zones and hasn't been looked at uh, for many 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 years and that's when the dem uh, demand built up and up to 2016 and that's why there was a desire for change but uh, this has been a continuous uh, process trying to go through several iterations and then COVID got in the way which is why the decision is now rather than a year ago um, so in all likelihood uh, if if this was decided and nothing changed then it'd be very difficult to envisage a uh, scenario that uh, the cabinet or officers would look at it again, but typical rate is five years. That's what we've been told before. 
So that's why we want a good solution from this tonight that residents want because it'll be very difficult for them to get anything again in the next five years. Thank you. Um, Geraldine, do you have any questions at all? Um, not really, um, uh, Chair, apart from the fact that, uh, as you, you or whoever it was just said, um, we have, um, we have uh, this has been a problem since the early 90s, uh, which we've been trying to resolve uh, with parking, uh, you know, all around the village ward area, the Belvedere's, um, and, and, and the whole area basically has been uh, a bit of a nightmare to try and sort out over uh, 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 years. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, I, you know, I haven't got any any quick answers, uh, but I agree that we we, we should um, try and and get something uh, moving now rather than expect uh, the residents to wait uh, 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 another five years before it'll it'll be considered again. You, you know, and uh, because of all the difficulties we've had in the past couple of years delaying everything it's just exacerbated the situation so uh, I'm just hopeful that we can come to some sort of agreement uh, tonight uh, in, in, in how to how, how, how to go forward thank you uh, Chairman, Chairman could I just clarify one thing <clears throat> to Councillor Stamford and to other panel members um, she did mention the Belvedere's and some of the other issues that that, that plague um, plague us in a nice sort of way because we enjoy it uh, in in parts of the ward, but we are talking here about Compton Road, which is right beside the library, bang in the centre, and and Compton and its parallel road, Orwin, are simply linked at the far end uh, by Worcester Road. So um, it, it's it's kind of almost a no through road in one sense. But they do, they are plagued, there's the word again, um, with uh, particularly evenings and weekends, but, but even during the day, with people wanting to park very close to the town centre. So it's, it's, it's not, 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 not the problem that exists elsewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, linking into what Geraldine said, and before we go into our public speakers, I just wanted to tease out a bit more um, what was mentioned about answering uh, Nigel's question about the frequency of change and iterations. Is it a confirmation that you've had from the cabinet member or is it a, an assumption about the five year frequency or or the fact that this can't be iterated in a, in a more of a nearer time period? I was talking about the generalities of how these things normally go. I mean, this is one of the oldest CPZs and it went 20 years without being reviewed and pressures and things have changed over those uh, over that intervening time uh, we also know that from other traffic management decisions it normally uh, takes a while for things to be allowed to float back to the surface again in the in the eyes of officers and, and the cabinet member but if he's willing to tweak it tonight and or allow some consideration then that'd be welcome i think anthony you had an expression of interest and then we'll move on to our public speakers Thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back very quickly. I, th I think from what I can gather, there's, there's two specific issues. So one is the additional parking bays on Arwen on the northern side, and the other is the change of the single yellows to double. Um, I, I wondered if you see a conflict or an inconsistency between what you said about, David, about the area being plagued by town centre parking and the maintaining of the single yellow line and how you reconcile those two those two issues? Well, well quite simply, obviously, <clears throat> during the day, during the week, uh, which is the only time these additional bays would be operating, <clears throat> they would only be available to the people who are able to occupy them. Now, in an evening, if there were double yellow lines, it, clearly members of the public who don't live in those roads um, would not be able to park there and would have to use the car park. Absolutely fine about that. Uh, but it, it would mean that the, the residents themselves may not be able to get a bay 
um, and nor would their visitors. Um, and, you know, we have to sort of be thinking about the benefits of, to the residents of accessibility um, for carers, family, friends, whatever. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now um, bring in our, our public speakers. I'm very, very grateful uh, that they've um, given up part of their evening to come here and speak. Um, so we have uh, Guy Halifax, uh, Leon Tong, Jason Evan Tovey. Have I pronounced everyone's name correctly? Excellent. So what, um, as I said, reiterating what I plan to do is um, each have two minutes to speak. I'll, I'll flag um, and raise your flag with the uh, traffic light system, 30 seconds left. Um, and then the panel will have an opportunity to ask you questions. And again, no doubt there may be opportunities at the end. So we're going to start off in that order as I read out. So Guy, would you mind addressing the panel, please, for two minutes? <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Guy Halifax, and I've lived in Compton Road for 30 years. Like many residents in the area, I do not have off-street parking. I'm here to speak in favour of the council's decision. I believe that the panel should recommend that council proceed with this decision. This matter has been going on for five years. <clears throat> We've had three consultations. We've explored numerous different options to improve the situation. And the council officers have set out their decision and reasoning in great detail. I'm speaking on behalf of the silent majority, the residents without off-street parking, and the residents that experience issues on a regular basis it's with the parking in the area. The council decision is, in our view, better than the current situation. It's worth noting that there are something like 720 households in the area, but only a small minority are now speaking out in opposition to this decision. The council's proposals give us most of what we want, and by that I mean dedicated residence parking bays, additional residence parking bays, no bollards, no mass double yellow lines, and restrictions on waiting at sensitive parts of the roads. The pressures on parking space, as people have mentioned, are greatest in Compton Road, being the closest street to the town centre. It is the parking street of choice for visitors to Wimbledon's nighttime economy. It also acts as the overspill car park from other roads which do not have enough parking spaces for the number of residents seeking to park there. So as I said at the beginning, I would like to suggest that the panel recommend that the council proceed with this decision. Thank you. Brilliant, no, thank you very much, um, Guy. Um, does the panel have any immediate questions um, for Guy? Or do we wanna reserve that for when we've heard all the public speakers? Good, I agree. Um, so can we now go to Leon, please? Thank you, Chair. Good evening. So the ask tonight, as Councillor Williams and Councillor Holden have pointed out, is to determine whether or not the decision should be called in. At least two decision-making principles of the Council's own constitution have been breached. They are namely clarity of aims and desired outcomes and consideration and evaluation of alternatives. And the decision should be referred back. Now, firstly, clarity of aims and desired outcomes. What were the aims and what were the desired outcomes? Was the aim to encourage car use or discourage it? Was the aim to increase safety for road users? Was the aim to increase access to Wimbledon town centre? Or was there some other aim? Where are the clear aims to be found? They're not in the consultation letter or in any document presented to the public. The council officer's December report refers to some generic aims, but they conflict and they're not tailored to the circumstances of the consultation. I asked, does each of you have confidence that if you were asked, you would state the same aim? And even if it's clear to the council and to the panel, to the residents of the ward, there's been a significant lack of clarity of aims. Now, this means that the desired outcomes were also not clear. 
the 2020 consultation newsletter relied upon a single plan to show the existing scheme as well as the proposed scheme but one masked the other masking the desired outcome now does each of you have confidence if asked to identify readily which is which thank you thank you very much and uh, jason thank you i'm just going to address consideration and valuation of alternatives the 2020 consultation letter um, look at page 60 of your papers contained a number of mechanisms for affecting change you either change the operational hours confer convert permit holder bays to resident permit holder bays add additional parking or any time waiting now the cabinet member um, chose to implement all the mechanisms that was somewhat surprising because of the 48 representations made, the vast majority was against all the proposals. And indeed, on my reckoning, only two were in favour of all the proposed mechanisms. As to the alternatives, I ask you to turn to page 25 of your papers. He merely identified one alternative. And I quote, the council um, could consider not to take any action. Yet the decision he had to make was not binary in nature. He plainly saw his decision as an all or nothing decision. A man who writes in the terms that, that, that were written has not considered all the array of alternatives before him. And in that way, I say that the council, uh, the cabinet member fell into error. Plausible alternatives were simply not addressed or evaluated. There was no evaluation of whether one um, or a couple of just some mechanisms could be implemented. One alternative was actually no additional parking bays on Compton Road, which is um, what Guy, I think, is arguing for. Another alternative is no additional bays in, bays in Orwin Road. Um, this should have been um, specifically addressed because it was the wish of the majority of residents, and they have to be consciously and conscientiously taken into account under the Sedley principles. Furthermore, in 2017, the lead officer had concluded there was no scope for additional parking bays on Orwin Road. See paragraph 68 of your papers. Uh, no parking on Orwin Road was identified as an option in 2019. See page 92. And the Weira group had already come up with recommendations um, which attracted um, widespread support for no parking on Orwin Road. As I've said, the cabinet member decided to implement all mechanisms in evaluative terms. This was disproportionate and a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to speak uh, so well and so passionately about your um, the, the issue at hand here. Uh, the panel, do you have any immediate questions? You want to put to all or some of our uh, guests so anthony anyone else first cool anthony and then uh i'll ask geraldine if you have a question as well anthony thank you chair and my questions for all three speakers um reading through the representations it seems to me that there's a little bit of a dispute about whether there is problems with traffic and parking on on these roads and i wondered if each of the speakers might outline for me whether they saw problems with traffic and or parking and what those were. So, Guy, would you mind going first? The way I see it is there's uh, three separate issues. One is uh, when there's a school run every day going to Willington School with the volume of traffic coming down the road. Uh, the second issue is when the parking bays are in operation and we find in particular on Compton Road, that residents from other roads are parking on Compton Road. And so when we come back to Compton Road, we can't park on our road and we're forced to drive about a mile to get to the other part of the CPZ. And then the other issue that people have talked about pre previously is um, uh, when the operating hours aren't working, uh, the evenings and the weekends. And uh, unlike some of the other answers, I do believe that this proposal will help with that situation because at the moment, if I come back at six o'clock on a Monday night and can't find a parking space, I can park on a yellow light, a single yellow line. 
but then I have to remember to move my car before the next morning so that I don't get a parking fine. If there are additional residents parking bays, it means I've got a better chance of finding a resident parking bay um, before the next morning. And in addition to that, obviously in our road, we've got a number of parents who are taking their children to school every day. They take their child to school and when they come back, they can't find a parking space and they're required to move park half a mile away. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So I'm going to just mention something um, that one of our neighbours, Keith Warner, has um, done a calculation numerically for zone W2 and the numbers don't add up in terms of the entire decision. The, the measures that have been proposed are not necessary. Numerically, there are enough spaces within zone W2 to not go all the way to uh, implementing particularly some bays, additional bays in Compton and additional bays in Alwyn. So to answer your question, the problem that I understand is attempting to be solved is capacity for parking. However, it does not need to be this specific solution that's being proposed. And the, new, the numbers we've uh, Keith has done a calculation for that. Jason, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, if I come, just on the school point, um, parking bays on Orwin Road would make the school um, operationals times impossible because at the moment parents can actually drop off and there is um, room for traffic to pass. If there are parking bays, there's nowhere for them to drop off other than blocking the middle of the road. And you're going to get, as you, you sometimes do when lorries are there and other vehicles are dropping off, you're going to get massive congestion. So um, parking bays are going to just cause massive problems at school times. Secondly, I don't actually, having lived there for 20 odd years myself, don't actually uh, counter the problems that um, Mr. Halifax seems to be alluding to. Um, there's often um, plenty of spaces within the parking bays um, on the roads. Ind indeed, tonight there were loads of spaces when we left. Uh, thirdly, mention is made of people coming in to park in the evenings. One point that is um, conspicuously absent from the papers is that, in fact, people are only parking on the yellow line at the Wimbledon Hill end of Orwin Road. And it rarely, it, very often most evenings, there's no parking on yellow lines. Um, on a Saturday and a Sunday, it tends to extend only about a third of the way down the road. Oh. Yeah, I just, um, having lived there, I just didn't quite see the problems that are being alluded to. And if one looked at the actual and went and analyzed the data that came through and the resident submissions, actually the number of complaints that are raised in relation to parking are very limited. And the solution of converting additional um, residence base, so permit holder base to resident permit holder base, would seem to address proportionately and sensibly the solution. And any difficulties that are perceived, I think, um, are overcome by the Weira paper, which hasn't been taken into account. Thank you all. Um, I mean, I've got my question. Reading, there's a lot of history with this with this issue that that's going on for a, for a while beyond even the five years. That, are, that various schemes have been proposed. And I wonder if I can hear um, some comments on, we co we've heard about whether this is the right scheme or not, but I would like to actually understand the, the do nothing option and the reality that there is, this is a very difficult um, needle to thread. And it'd be good to understand your perceptions of, of that and whether these proposals would do the harm that you've outlined or whether we can whether the existing proposals are there but again i'd also like to understand from a process perspective given everything that is um outlined in the responses it was a challenging um area for the cabinet member to support and support all residents there 
So I didn't know if there was any reflections or comments on that at all. Um, just the, the, I was asking the public members in terms of um, their reflections on, on that, because we've heard a lot about, we don't, we don't like this, we like this, we maybe want this. So it's, again, it's a bit of a negotiation going on rather than on the actual process of the consultation itself, on the actual efforts the cabinet member has made on, on the fact that this has been going on for five, for at least five years. And there doesn't seem to be, at various points, there seems to be consensus and then the, the consensus breaks apart. So it'd be good to actually understand that from, from you who live in the area, live and breathe in this. Um, Guy, I don't know if, if you want to add anything on that. Thank you. I think, as I said in my short speech, um, we definitely believe the council decision will be better than the current situation. Um, I, th I think it's uh, difficult to believe that people are still sitting here after five years trying to argue that there isn't an issue. There, there clearly is an issue. Uh, my own experience is that I don't have off-street parking, and your experience living in the area as a resident is very different as a, someone who has off-street parking as opposed to someone who has, does not. When I first moved to the area, I had off-street parking, and I turned my front bay into a, a garden, um, so I've seen everything, really. Um, there's lots of different solutions that we could come up with and lots of tweaks that we could come up with, and all of them would have slightly different impacts. But I'm clear that the council decision is better than the current situation. But um, coming back to what some of the others have said, your experience in Compton Road when you don't have off-street parking is very, very different to someone in Alwyn Road who does have off-street parking, who doesn't have to worry when they come back to the area as to where they're going to park. Thank you. Um, Tony? Um, so, Councillor Mundy, thank you for your question. I, as I understand, I think you're asking our experience of the process and the consultation, is that correct? That's correct. Partly because, again, we're here and we only see what you see here, but you've lived it, you've breathed it, you've, you've been a part of it for a while. Yeah. So focusing on the process and the consultation and not the details of the uh, double or single yellow lines. The process, I appreciate the officers and the cabinet members, all the efforts they've been to over a long period of time. That is not up for debate. However, the consultations, there were two consultations followed by a statutory consultation and the direction of the outcomes and the aims were not clear. And one of the principles of the council's constitution is they have to be clear and that needs to be clear for the residents as well as to the council i think that's really important um so yeah ho hopefully that that is our experience it, um, at the beginning the first consultation was i think about hours i think you've all read it as much uh and then it changed to uh a, a different question and then only in the third statutory consultation was there's this idea of bays so that's not clear at all in terms of aims or outcomes so that's been my experience of the process but i do appreciate the efforts that everyone went to officers councillors and the cabinet member jason uh, thank you mr chairman um if i've understood your question correctly um it deals partly in the process where I think uh, Leon and myself have outlined why we say the process was actually flawed. Um, and just to add slightly to that, it's if you actually to look at the uh, lead officer's paper, um, one of the options he suggests is no parking on the north side of Orwin Road, which the council member didn't, the cabinet member didn't seem to take into account. But really picking up, hopefully, your chairman, your invitation. I don't think anybody is saying um, nothing. What we had here was a decision which implements everything. Um, and we're not saying that the answer is to do nothing. We're saying, in fact, there's a far more proportionate way that was put forward by the WIRA group with collective agreement. My understanding is that Mr. Halifax was on that group and on that paper. And we say that that collective approach from the residents hasn't actually been addressed and properly considered.
considered by the cabinet member, and it should have been. What we're facing here today, as I'm looking at it, is really somewhat of an opportunistic stance by some, because they take the view that the cabinet member's decision is better for some people, and some people are benefiting um, from it, and they like it. Whereas the wider collective view is reflected in the WERA document, and that should be the thing that the cabinet member considers. Thank you very much. Um, well, we can hear from the cabinet member uh, now, so if I call him in, uh, Councillor Welton. Um, thank you, Chair. And can I take this opportunity of um, thanking the people who have um, spoken tonight and given the views on the decision that um, I took in relation um, to this proposal. It's fair to say that this has been a very long process, uh, via a number of consultations. Um, firstly, obviously, in relation to um, the extension of hours, which obviously were rejected um, following um, informal um, consultations. And obviously, this proposal in creating additional um, spaces. Um, it was a decision, obviously, I thought very long and um, hard about um, before making um, that judgment. And clearly, there are uh, clearly I could have uh, rejected uh, the proposal, um, but I did decided not to. Um, in relation to the additional parking bays. Um, I did take a walk down both roads, Compton and Alwyn Road, um, and it is my view as cabinet member that this could, these both these roads um, could accommodate um, additional um, spaces. Um, there is even narrow roads in the borough whereby there is um, parking um, on both sides. Um, clearly, this current arrangement um, happened um, from when the original CPZ was and put in, I believe, back in 1996, a long time ago. Um, but I think I am conscious as well that there are considerable parking pressures um, in um, the local um, area. Um, and there is clearly not everybody has um, access um, to off-street um, parking. And I believe that this decision um, is the correct one to take. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so questions from the panel. We had uh, Dave, then Nick, and then David. Dave? Thank you, Chair. A very brief question to the Cabinet member uh, regarding um, Willington School on Worcester Road at the end of the road. <clears throat> Does that school have a school street zone? And if not, are there any plans to introduce a school street zone around that school for pick-up and drop-off times? Uh, no, the Wilmington School doesn't currently have a um, school street. Uh, there is no further plans for more school streets in the borough. We have one of the highest numbers um, in London, um, but clearly, obviously, that is continually um, under uh, review. Nick? Mine was a comment rather than a question. Perhaps we'll wait for a bit later. No worries. Um, David and then Anthony. I'm um, just... Um... Officers may be able to answer this. On um, pages uh, 27 and 28, uh, paragraphs 2.2 and 2.7, uh, they're very similar. Uh, are they the two different uh, consultation responses? The, the, back in 2017 and I think 2019. Yeah, are they? <laughs> Amazingly, it's amazing that after two years, nothing changed at all in opinion exactly the same number of people completed the questionnaire and almost exactly the same responses came back which leads me to believe that people still feel exactly the same today now that's my only question but i have some statements but as nick says i'll i'll wait until the end would you like do you have you had a chance to look at the paper to comment back on david's question Sorry, what was, and it's different, or is it the same? So yes, we did do a such and um, we did do an informal consultation in 2017, and it all started off by receiving a petition, the residents asking for a change in hours. But I think it's already been said that this is one of the oldest CPZ that we've had in the borough. And over the years, 
design guidelines and criteria and adopted practice have changed. So with any CPZ that we review and with any new CPZs, we look at the whole zone. We just don't home in into one specific aspect of that zone. So we did look at the hours of operation. We did look at the actual extent of the double yellow lines at the junctions, um, at passing gaps. And with any CPZ, we try to maximize the number of parking bays particularly for the residents. So in this case, we identified that, yes, we could change some of the base to resident-only base, which is what we're proposing to do. That will stop the business permit holders um, to be utilizing those base, which was one, one of the issues. But also, the road is actually wide enough. The width of the ro road doesn't lie. It's wide enough to allow parking on both sides, and we are introducing double yellow lines as strategic locations, as well we do with every other zone, to allow as to act as passing gap. So you do maintain that flow of traffic whilst you are accommodating the needs of the residents themselves. We're not creating spaces for um, sort of outsiders coming in. These are for permit holders, like Mr. Halifax has said. When they, some residents, they purchase the permit, they get home, they really should have access to a permit, to, to a um, permit holder bay or a resident bay, but they can't. So they stop on a single yellow line, the next day they have to move their cars. But there is no good reason for that because the road space exists. We've um, all read the, some of the comments that people have said, and one thing I need to clarify is that when it comes to a statute consultation, it's not about numbers. It's very much about the reasons for the objections. So what we did do was we read all the objections, looked at the reasons, and we tallied up what people were objecting in terms of those who were crossing the footway illegally to gain access to their off-street parking. So which means that the base adjacent to the front garden would stop them from doing that illegal activity. So we offered the option of we either put um, bollards to the back of the footway, which we rather we didn't do because it narrows the footway and it's also expensive and it's unsightly. So we provide the proposing parking bays that can be used by per resident permit holders and their visitors. So that's one of our recommendations um, that we proposed. And yes, you can do a whole lot of variations but as yet, I've never come across with any traffic schemes or parking scheme that we have satisfied 100% of the residents. You could forever come up with 101 varied options. You would never satisfy people um, across the whole community. So, and we cannot see the disbenefit of the additional parking base. It's there for the residents, no one else. It will not obstruct parking. In terms of the, um, the school, they're not entitled to park on the single yellow line. They're not entitled to park in the permit holder base. In fact, by accommodating that, we're not going to be able to stop them from driving in. The whole idea is to stop parents getting into that road. So although it's not subject to a school street, and maybe one day, we don't know, but for now, one of the... Um, tools that we have access to is to stop parents from parking where they need to go. So why then allow them to stop on a single yellow line that they're not actually allowed to do that? But the parking base will be occupied by permit holder base. So then the parents, you know, no, they cannot stop in the middle of the road. And to be honest, a lot of times they don't because they have to escort the children into the school. So then they could go and park in the car parks. So that is kind of a moot point for us. This proposal is to basically maximize the number of parking spaces for the residents whilst maintaining flow of traffic, which will also allow for servicing. And I, that, that's all I can say. Thank you very much um, for that answer. Uh, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. I have two quick questions for the cabinet member and one for the officers, if that's okay. To the cabinet member, I wonder, if he could set out exactly what the problem this decision is solving, that would be great. And secondly, if he could outline, if he could confirm that the decision he took was between this proposal and between doing nothing, and, and between doing nothing, was that the 
alternatively considered. And my question for officers, if I may, is in the 2017 consultation, there's a paragraph in the report that says Holwyn Road is not um, suitable for additional bays. And then there's an equivalent paragraph in the later consultation, which is exactly the same, except it's missing a different word. And so it says it is suitable. And I just wondered why, why the change in view, given the road hasn't changed. Martin, do you want to go first? I think in relation to um, Councillor Fairclough's point, um, the thing it's solving is creating additional bays to deal with the demand um, for parking spaces um, in um, the local area. We are aware um, of the considerable pressures um, that um, do exist um, in this locality. Um, in terms um, of the alternatives, um, the alternatives would be obviously I didn't implement um, any additional bays. Um, and only implemented effectively the yellow lines, which are needed there for road safety um, purposes. Thank you. And then um, if officers could follow up on the question relating to um, the, the, the paragraph about Aldwin and the suitability for uh, parking spaces. And I've got a question to follow up with as well. To be honest here, the engineer at the time, um, she was somewhat inexperienced and I think she based her comments on the feedback and the meetings with certain residents. So she automatically assumed that what the resident state is what she's going to um, be put in. She's no longer with us, but it, a, a mistake was made. Um, but in the latest proposals, the roads have been measured. Um, and they vary between 7.2 and 7.5 and metres. So therefore, we are confident that the road width exists to allow passage of traffic. And let's not forget, this is not a free, it's not a free road. Effectively, it's a cul-de-sac. So it's primarily used by the residents themselves and obviously the traffic to the school, which hopefully we're trying to stop. You remove the parking, then they have no need to be there. Um, so uh, th this is a far better road than compared to some of the other roads that we have to deal with that are free traffic, they are on main roads, some of them, and they are bumper to bumper parking, and yet they don't seem to sort of suffer in, in a way that we are being led to believe here that would be a, an adverse impact. I also need to clarify something. So the option of to do nothing, that's always an option for every scheme, and that is something that we are required to put in our report. So that is why it's there. It, it, you will find that in every single every traffic and every parking scheme. So that's the reason why you see that option there. The other alternative was based on the feedback that we received where some of the residents were saying that the road is not wide enough, it would cause an obstruction if you put in parking bays. Then the resp our response to that was, if that's the case, then we have to put double your lines in. So either the road is wide enough to accommodate parking or is not wide enough. So a single yellow line would on, will allow parking in the evenings and is relevant whether parking happens in the morning or in the evening is either obstructive or is not. So that is when we do our design work, this is, the, this is what we work on. Jodine, do you have a question at all? <clears throat> Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, somebody mentioned at the beginning of the debate about uh, me focusing on three roads. Uh, 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 on sorry, on 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 the, uh, the whole area, rather than just the three roads that you're uh, you you are focusing on. Um, and I did that because um, <laughs> the, it does impact. On nearby road, by by roads, even if you're just focusing on on uh, whatever it is, um, uh, um, uh, Worcester, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name now. <laughs> uh, the three, uh, well, yeah, and 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 so therefore you have to take that into consideration. Um, as as, as Mitra has said, you you know we we've been through this for many many years. Uh, with traffic schemes across the borough, not just in Wimbledon, but across the borough, where we've never been able to get to a stage where uh, we can please all the people all the time, if you like. 
um, where all the residents agree with the proposals. Um, and and uh, I think that the, the covenant may be, has a very difficult job um, in making a decision that uh, is the most reasonable one that he can make uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the circumstances and the situations available to him uh, because of the different circumstances that uh, um, uh, every traffic scene has to be considered uh, takes. And, and uh, so, um, therefore, uh, as I say, <laughs> you know, it's not a one, set, a one, a one um, uh, scheme uh, uh, fits all uh, situation. Every mm -hmm. area every area that we look at is is unique uh for some reason or other which is why it's so difficult to make uh to get uh, uh, a complete agreement uh, thank you Joe. On... No, uh, completely understand that point um i'd like to start to um wrap things up we've been almost this for an hour and we'll start to move on some comments but i've got a final uh, question i just want to put to officers and understand i mean there are strong views here tonight expressed, but also there are many residents who may be watching from home or may be catching this second hand. And a point was made earlier about how the council and the department would iterate and process feedback once um, any procedure and any sort of new measures are implemented. I was hoping you can expand a bit further about how you, once you implement any solution, how you get further feedback, how you iterate, how you change. Is it a five-year timetable? Is it much less? Can you just expand that so we understand it a bit more? So um, we, did, we did used to have a review process in which um, we put a control parking zone, and was it three years or so? Yeah, so every two years, we would then do a review, but unfortunately, because of the funding and resources, a decision that a decision was made that we will review a zone if the residents petition us for a change. So that change could be changing hours, or it needs to be a big change for the petition. So are they changing hours or make um, changing all the um, the permit holder base throughout the whole zone, for example, to resident base. But with the smaller changes, for example, if you, you have a zone and it's not on the program for the review, and some people come along and say, right, can you change on T number of base? Then we will add it to a program and we would just be specific on those changes. But if we get a petition to say we want to rezone it and we want a different to be in a different zone then we will review the whole zone. So it really depends on what the residents are asking us to do. If it's a smaller scheme they want, then we could do that in isolation. If it's gonna have a bigger impact on the entire zone, then that would be a full review. So going back to your question, we used to have a program to review zones, but that was then stopped. And it was a case of, if we get a petition for the change, then we will review the zone. So in this case, we will put, if it's decided to go ahead and proceed with the implementation of the scheme, if there is an issue and we get a complaint from the residents, it's, then we will have a look at it, we will investigate it, and then we're quite specific. As, we make it very specific to that request or to that complaint, rather than looking at the overall picture. So that is how we normally deal with all the parking management, be it in a control parking zone or be it outside of the control parking zone. You know, even like with outside of shopping plates changing um, hours, maximum stay from one hour to two hours. So when we get these requests, we program it, we, we do the consultation and then we, we implement it if there is majority support or if there is a merit in the change that is being asked. Thank you. No, it, it was it was only because, again, correct me if I'm wrong. This this may be one of the most um, debated about changes, maybe in the borough. Yeah, not yeah. So, 
again, it's how you, it, it's in this particular case, how you program in that as part of the process as default rather than waiting for feedback as it were. Um, but I mean, as you've outlined, you, you've outlined the procedure as, as it is. Um, so I'd like to move to some uh, comments now. So I promised uh, Nick first and David then Nigel. Nick. Well, thank, thank you for that. I wasn't expecting to be first, but thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've done quite a lot of these uh, alongside Latchme um, when I was in uh, a Collierwood uh, uh, councillor. And we always considered it absolutely essential as ward councillors to be totally neutral on the subject, whatever our personal opinions might have been, that we were totally neutral, that, that the, the outcome depended entirely on what the residents uh, required. Uh, and that is because, just as Geraldine has said, just as well, m m many of the speakers have said, you can't, you're never going to please everybody. In fact, what you can actually see from these papers here is that it's not resident against councillor, resident against cabinet member, it's resident against resident. If you look at pages 78 to page 80, you have got a virtual 50-50 split on what, the, uh, on what the residents actually want. Now there are there 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 you can say that fifty three to forty three or whatever uh, you can say well that's a, a, a clear majority but it's there's there's very little clarity about it if you actually look at some of the comments within here you've got people from Compton Road saying I'm really in favour of the Alwyn Road uh, uh, proposals but I don't want the Compton Road ones and the people from Alwyn Road who are saying really hate the Alwyn Road ones but I'm in favour of the Compton Road ones it is resident against resident and so what Martin uh, Welton has had to do here is produce a judgment of Solomon uh, which uh, I can see that many people won't like I'm sure that many people won't like, uh, but realistically, I'm not. I'm not saying that, I, that, that that it was the right judgment. I don't know that it was the right judgment, but realistically, all it is is it's a looking at what the people have asked for and trying to come up with a solution to it. And I, the one thing that I am convinced of, is that nobody here has come up with the right answer. Nobody here has come up with the right answer. There have been comments about process, there have been comments about this and that, but ultimately, this is a solution. Whether it's the right solution or not is at this stage almost relevant. It is a solution. And I suggest that you try to get on with it, quite honestly. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, you can revisit it. Our first um, uh, CPZ that we did in Collier's Wood, that I did in Collier's Wood, which was um, a very long time ago now, it was 51% of people in favour of it, 49% against it. It was, it was a nightmare. We revisited it um, four years later. 68% of people were in favor of it, 32% of people were against it. Right now, to this day, 20 years on, there are still people who are saying how dreadful it is. And they'll give you plenty of good reasons. Why won't they latch me? But the, the, the fact is that you made a decision because you had to make a decision. Whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, I'm not prepared to say. It is a decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, David? So um, I think I've got the chronology right now, and I'm thankful to everybody that's um, spoken tonight. It seems to me that uh, a number of residents contacted the council before 2017 and said they wanted change. Um, it's not documented what that change was, not qualitatively or quantitatively. Uh, but when there was the first consultation, um, there was um, uh, and, and, and it specifically was about days and hours, not about capacity uh, or additional bays. Uh, but people were against by about 10%. Uh, and then that was uh, repeated two years later. Amazingly, I mean, I was, I mean, exactly the same number of people responded. Exactly the same. 
but with the same result as well, which was they were against that change, which was days and hours. But at some stage between 2019 and the next consultation, uh, the objective, if there was a specific one to start with, changed from hours and days to capacity. And then there was a consultation um, to add capacity. And as the officers say, the uh, road is wide enough and there was capacity. So it made sense to add additional bays. And the officers are absolutely right. Who would argue against additional bays? I absolutely follow that. Uh, but the people were against it, which amazed me, but they were. Um, and I think Louis made some very good points tonight. The school is quite different from uh, normal schools in terms of its catchment areas is huge. So there will be children being uh, driven by car. I'm not saying that's the good thing, uh, but there is. Um, also, it's a one way street. So um, if there were ever a school street, you'd have cars turning around. Uh, regardless of what you think, um, that would, that's what would happen. Uh, and they do have coaches and they have nowhere to put those coaches. So they do park in the street. So at the moment, what the yellow lines, and I never thought I'd ever say this, but the yellow lines are a good thing, the single yellows, because it allows very short term parking for the school, for parents, for drop offs, for the waitroses, Ocados, et cetera and for an overspill of the capacity. So I do agree that uh, the single yellow lines are a good thing. But what I'd also say is that, um, you know, helping that school is a good thing and we need to leave some space for that. Um, I fully accept what the officers are saying, but I don't think anybody has agreed with their, their solution. And I'm, I don't think it's a bad solution at all, but uh, people do. Um, I've got a slight, um, I'd rather more businesses did use those streets actually, because I'd like more business uh, and I would like people, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's the only area where there is um, people saying we don't need more parking bays. My God, I mean, on the other side, W5, W6, we're desperate, uh, 5F. But I would actually say that this isn't the right solution because nobody's actually asked for it. And I'd go back to Wera and, and work with them and come out with a, uh, another solution. Bearing in mind, please try to keep the single yellows. Please leave some space for the school. I'm not denigrating what the officers have done, but I do think this is not the right solution. So all we're asking is for it to be, go back to the cabinet level. Thank you, and Nigel and then Anthony afterwards. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, and you know, do, do you um, uh, agree uh, agree what um, most um, pe 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 people have um, said? But but all the we uh, need 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 to to uh, we we uh, mean um uh uh. Do, Neutral, and um, they um, uh, a, a number, a number of uh, what, 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 which, whichever, um, have there been any um, any thoughts on the uh, possible uh, look on uh, of it on the nearby uh, no, no with such as um, uh, um wood, woodside road and a more more road? It will um, will uh, probably um just just um good. And um, being in a mine in the uh, town uh, centre, the, the, there's new um, developments have been, been uh, proposed. Therefore, it will probably uh, cause more, um, more um, you know, cause and uh, traffic. But I um, do, do, do um, agree that the um, 
school need, 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 needs to be given a verse on poetry. And um, what, what many in the, uh, long, in the long term you need to uh, think ahead of getting the uh, traffic flow, flow then uh, risk, risking have, having having a good a, a good knock in, in the young um, area you, you need to uh, find ways to um to um to keep the um traffic going and also minimize the uh, risk of of uh, bad uh, quality thank you Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Anthony. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, to everybody who's spoken tonight. Um, in contrast to, to my colleagues uh, across the chamber, um, I don't think it's enough to say this is a decision, we need to get on with it. We're clearly here to review that decision and whether that's been made properly. But equally, I don't think we're here to talk about whether we think that single yellow lines would be better than double yellow lines and so on and so forth. We, we were given the task of reviewing the two um, allegations, whether they've been made out. One, that there was a lack of clarity in the aims and objectives. And, and I don't agree that that's been made out. I think it's clear from um, the papers, the decision and from the evidence of the um, cabinet member that, that he believes um, that this is to relieve parking pressures in the area and that's a maybe right or wrong but that is a decision he's allowed to take and you have an opportunity in not too long to cast your opinion on that decision um, I'm less well I'm more convinced by the argument that there hasn't been proper consideration of alternatives I didn't find the cabinet members um, explanation of the decision he took terribly convincing. The officers clearly uh, have thought about a lot of things, but I'm not sure the decision maker has, and we are here to review uh, whether the decision maker has properly considered the alternatives. So I, I am on the, bo the border of thinking that that has been made out. Um, what I would add is that I do think from, from the evidence in the pack, um, there's quite a lot of evidence that there are some traffic problems on the road, albeit they are congestion as, as well as parking and the issues of the school um, and the traffic moving up and down the road. Um, and I w after we make the decision, whatever that decision is, I, I might like to come back and, and offer the panel another recommendation that we might consider. Um, because I think what's quite clear is if the decision is taken, that it should be reviewed and we should make sure that safety is uh, for, for children, especially at the school, is, is, properly, is properly considered. I know the officers have given technical advice on the width of the road. I know a lot of residents are concerned about, about that. Um, and I think there's room for us to, to be able to look at that after we take the decision. Thank you very much. Um, any further comments? No? Okay, so... Um, I'll sum up afterwards as well. So for those of you who, who, who may not be familiar with this process, so on the, on the paper in front of us, there, are, there is a, a, a question and with two answers. So I'll read those answers out. So do we as a panel refer this decision back to cabinet member for uh, reconsideration? Or do we decide not to refer the matter back to cabinet member uh, in which case, the decision will take immediate effect. Now, this, of course, doesn't. Um, we we can also add uh, comments to that decision as as as, as well. Either way, so I'm going to uh, pose the question, and then I'm going to um, ask um, for those who are uh, supporting A to put their hands up, and then those who are supporting B to put their hands up separately. So, um, can those who are considering the information provide a response to the call in as follows? Those who would like to refer the decision back to the cabinet member for a reconsideration, please raise their hands. One. You can't half vote. It's two. Two. Um, uh, Aidan, it's Geraldine. Can I um, go for recommendation A, please? You can do, um, but it won't be cast um, as because you're, you're remote. Well, I know. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll note that for the record. Um, yes, David, we're voting. You, you're...
Could be, that's fine. So we'll move on now to those who decided not to refer the matter back to the cabinet member, uh, raise their hands. Cool, one, two, three, four, five. So the decision by this panel is not to refer the matter back to the cabinet member, um, but it doesn't take away from the fact that this is a really, really um, important decision, but also it's one that residents in those roads need to live with. Um, so what I would be minded to uh, recommend and request the cabinet member and officers to do is we heard there is a process of review but I would ask that we can hard stop in a review period for at least 12 months, collecting feedback as we go, and taking a decision to feed back to this panel and or appropriate community panels so that it's there in the open and residents can see that. And if any further iterations need to be taken, they can be taken. Can I get some support for that? Yes, I, I, one thing I would say is, but what is a review? Is that a consultation or just a, a response? I think that's a really good question. Uh, Dave first and then Nick. We've made a decision, the council, the cabinet member's decision stands. We had an explanation earlier from the officer about how they um, review traffic measures. The decision's made, the decision stands. Move next item. Okay, so. I, I, I Chair, if, if it's all right, I will, um, uh, I appreciate what, what, what David has said, but. Uh, I do do think there should at some stage be a review, but the review uh, we we have normally done reviews at four years four years intervals, not one year interval. One year is nothing like enough time for it to bed in, I'm afraid. So so uh, can, can I ask you, the officers what 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 recommendations they'd have for a review period? It really depends what you mean by a review. What exactly are we reviewing? I think that's a really good question and it's a fair question. For me, it will be more about an assessment of what was implemented, has it done the job, and has it raised additional unintended consequences? There's Because outside this room here, there's clear, there's clear views either side, but outside this room, there are many residents who um, have concerns, many residents who have vocalised those, many who haven't. So it's given an opportunity to understand, has this done the job for the time being? That's, type of, that's, that's my definition of review. Thank you, Chair. I think in terms of the review, I think it's quite clear it's, you know, it's the congestion made worse by the changes. And I think officers will know how to measure that. And I just think we want to put it on record that we recognize that's a review, of, uh, that's a concern oh. of residents. And we want to make sure that that's not overlooked going forward. It may be that it doesn't have that effect, in which case, fantastic. Um, but it'd be good to, to have that come back in some fashion. James. Chair, if I may, the, I, I think that, um... My, my colleague highlighted that we do not have a formal review process, um, both because once the uh, measure is implemented, it, it stands. And secondly, um, it's resource intensive to, to do such things. Um, the mechanism is if there is a, a forthcoming petition from um, residents, I think that's something that is open to them to do at any time. But I think it was something that we, we do not have any formal processes to undertake a review. Um, it may well be that there's an informal feedback to, to this group, but that would that would not necessarily be binding on the team or on the cabinet member. Chair, I'm happy with Fine. that as well. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, those who came uh, to speak to us this evening. Um, and appreciate um, it may not have been the outcome some of you were hoping for. Thank you. So can we move on to the next item, which is uh, planning enforcement, and uh, Leslie's going to um, present for us. Um, I think if we wait one minute while um, our guests leave the room, then we'll resume.
Yeah, I'll see if I can um, just share my screen. Just bear with me a minute. So, so thank you. Is about the um. <laughs> Both and um both both men. Uh, I know uh, I know from from the um pre 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 previous um we 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 region it was um co college um board but in you know, two days um agenda is it, um just a a, a person. Station, but but in the uh, last month, um, there is a name on page pages of of the um of, 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 of um this. But why is it um taken um out? <laughs> no, no, it's a good question. So um, last uh, meeting the business, there was, there was a lot of business. And I made the call to move it to this uh, meeting panel. You're correctly right, Nigel. The paper stands for this meeting as well. Yeah. But Les has very kindly put it together in something more digestible um, in terms of her presentation as well. So the paper you can absolutely refer to the two, and they're all they're all class as one bit of business. But good question, Leslie. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, so I'm Leslie Barachizade. I'm the interim head of development management and building control and one of my teams is planning enforcement so you will have read hopefully the report and the action plan that i put together but i thought it might be helpful if i just gave you a very brief overview of planning enforcement what we do and what we're intending to do so Planning enforcement includes a number of different things, but it's primarily about breaches of planning consent and felling of trees with TPOs on them or that are within a conservation area without consent. So I'd just like to clarify that many people are not aware that planning enforcement is not a statutory service but it's purely at the discretion of the council. It's also really important to realize that any action we take has to be proportionate and in the interests of the community. We have to be mindful of the harm caused not only to those affected, such as neighbors, but also the harm on those that have committed the breach, which might surprise you. So we have to consider issues like their health, their housing needs and their welfare. So we need to balance numerous issues. So it is critical to act as a deterrent, stopping people from just building what they like without planning consent and just developers cutting down trees that they consider are in their way. But as mentioned, the action must be proportionate. We can't just take someone to court if we can instead get something put right, possibly by getting them to submit a retrospective application or by reinstating a tree. We've got to be mindful that we can incur costs as a council if we cannot fully evidence the issue and we cannot justify our action, for instance, taking someone to court. So, as mentioned, whilst planning enforcement is not a statutory service, taking action acts as a deterrent. So, we do need to maintain the integrity of the decision-making process. 
So as a team within the borough, we do have a lot of issues. Um, so external issues, not everyone understands what we cover. For instance, HMOs are a common complaint, but if they're six or below, they're covered by permitted development. And yet we do get called out to cases where you know we shouldn't be called out and that does take a lot of time um sometimes we get called out because people have built in their rear garden but again could be permitted development so a lot of misunderstanding there we also have quite a few internal issues so we have a very small team. We have a heavy reliance currently on agency staff, which is obviously more difficult to manage and more expensive. And we do have very high expectations from members, quite, you know, legitimately. So one thing to be aware of is that planning enforcement creates a lot of negative headlines. These are just a couple of um, things. I think the first one was from Bristol, although I can't remember for sure. Um, and the other one, of course, many of you will have seen, is from Merton. So what we need to do is to knock out these negative headlines and counteract them with positive news. So, for instance, we were recently awarded £30,000 in costs against someone who we had served enforcement notices on several times and they hadn't complied. So we were very successful there. We passed that to our communications team and they publicised it. And as you can see, we had 655 click-throughs to the details of the story. And we also had lots and lots of positive comments. It's a really good publicity. Another example of a positive outcome is where we had a car wash suddenly starting up and this was reported both by the ward councillor and the cabinet member and so we were able to take action very very quickly and shut it down and then following that we also got them to take down their advertisements another one's a good example particularly in these times with climate change um, quite a few people like to pave over their front gardens. Now, it can be covered by permitted development if they use permeable materials and follow certain rules and regulations, but too often people aren't aware of this. They simply concrete it over, they remove the boundary fence, and you're left with that on the left. And of course, there's nowhere for rainwater to run off, um, really problematic. This particular one, we addressed very, very quickly. A neighbour complained about it, and it was actually a Clarion resident. We took enforcement action, and we got them to actually, in fact, an improvement on what they had there before. So not just reinstating, but improving what was there before. This, this one, um, we do still hear about that. Uh, this is where a lot of people were very unhappy about it, and they're not necessarily satisfied with um, how we remedied it. So this is Trust Ford Plough Lane. Um, 11 trees were removed without consent. We did get them to reinstate 11 trees in exactly the same position. They were semi-mature trees. We also got them to plant 12 new silver birch trees along the river Wandle. So, you know, greenery was not just restored, 
but it was enhanced. And we've also put TPOs on 26 trees at that site. There are some pictures. Now, they're not fantastic pictures, but if you look very, very carefully, you can see all of the semi-mature trees. Uh, I mean, the leaves aren't on them there, so you can't really see them that clearly. But it is a good example. Um, and it's what we could do to put the situation right. But we do still get criticisms because people say, oh, you should have dragged them to court. Well, we can't always do that. What we look to do is to get things put back to how they were or better. So, as I said, well, let me see if I can go back to that one. As I said, you've had the report and the action plan. So some of the points really summarizing in the action plan, our number one priority is to reduce the backlog we've got. And there are lots of other things that we have to do, and they're all integral to reducing the backlog. Um, so we have to really get to grips with what our, our stats are showing us. We've got lots of procedures we need to improve, and we've already started doing that, looking at, at the flow of how complaints come in. We do need to have a clear policy and make it public. I've already said a lot of people don't understand what we actually do and what we, we can do legitimately. And we have to counteract negative publicity by positive successes. So work closely with the communications team. We need to manage complaints from members and from the public. And we're particularly bad, for instance, on, on going back. So yes, we'll record, we'll record the complaints and we'll say, oh yes, we'll, we'll pop out and look at this. But very often we, we then leave people hanging. So they don't know, they don't know what's happened. So we need to get better. We definitely need to improve our IT systems, but it's not necessarily as, as easy as was requested in the council motion, whereby you know, we get a, a portal put up. It's really, really complex, but we are working with IT to improve our systems. And we're also, restructuring the team at the moment we're well down the road on that so that's the end so hopefully that was helpful it was thank you very much for taking the time to go through it and actually illustrate some of the challenges and opportunities you or you and your team have have, have, have taken on um so um anticipate doing one round of questions at least um colleagues may or may not have recommendations so Nigel first, then Anthony, then is there any other hand up? No, Nigel. Thank you, um, Chair. Is it, is it um, possible if I may um, ask, how far beyond time uh, are, you, are you with the, um, with the um, back uh, log? Thank you. We we have about 850 cases um, at the moment. We receive about 400 to 450 cases a year. Um, I think it's also important to be clear what we mean by the backlog, because there are different definitions um, in different authorities. So in some authorities, they only call the backlog those cases that have not been opened and considered at all. For us, the backlog are those cases that we haven't closed. So you could argue that they're not really a backlog. Um, sorry, you're going to answer me. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Leslie, for, for that. Um, in the action plan, I think it's recruiting of an additional officer to help with the backlog. I think that's right in the action plan. Um, even during this term, I think we've seen two or three action plans to reduce the backlog. We're still pretty much at the same backlog as we were uh, when, when I started being counselor in 2018. And I just wondered whether you thought one officer was going to 
uh, be able to assist with that and we are going to reach the targets of reducing it by 50 percent as you'd like to thank you um the we have appointed appointed one officer that's true to assist with the backlog and that officer has so far he's been here under three months but he's so far been allocated 48 cases and he has got 24 cases ready for closure so that is quite a, a significant number but the answer really to your question is that no um recruiting that additional person isn't going to assist that much with the backlog however the other items that i i put up on the last slide are the things that will help considerably with that backlog and I did commit to reducing the backlog by 50% if we carry out all of those actions by the end of December. And I'm quite confident that we could do that. I've got a question on, on again, back on your definition of backlog. Have we, I mean, how do we, do we have those comparative definitions available? How, how is that done in, in your sector? Um, how can you, we learn from those who, uh, who potentially use the same definition as us, et cetera, because to just understand that a bit more, because I think, you know, what gets banded around, unless you, unless quite rightly, you dig beneath the detail, um, the top line statistics looks more favorable in some areas than they do in others. I don't really have, um, you know, lot, lots of different figures and definitions from elsewhere. I'm only going on um, because I'm an interim where I've, I've worked elsewhere. And I simply know that um, many authorities, they, they don't even open their cases. So the cases, the cases are not touched at all. And they are what's called the backlog. And then they have their other cases that they have opened and they're a sort of in-between situation. And then they've got their cases that are closed. Here, we, we open all of them. As soon as we, we open a case, we allocate it to an officer and the officer starts looking at it. So we don't have any cases that haven't been touched. And so I can only go on my previous experience, really. It, it sounds as if, um, yeah, that's, that sounds a much preferable way of doing things than to not bothering to look at them at all. I think so, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, Geraldine, do you have a question at all? Um, uh, thank you. Not, not, a, not, not a question particularly, but um, a thanks uh, to Leslie for the update. Uh, and also thanks uh, on behalf of my ward, Figs, and including Gravenie Ward, uh, where we have been working together for many years with housing enforcement and planning enforcement as we have a huge amount of cases uh, between us which have been uh, particularly challenging and um, so, so I do appreciate how difficult it has been uh, um, uh, following up on, on, on all these issues and and I hope you 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 do as you as you're saying your your recruitment um, and uh, and also uh, of course yes um, improving the uh, the IT system which is uh, a bit tricky to uh, to deal with uh, uh, at the best of times. So uh, so just a thank you really for for, for your hard work. I, I know how difficult it's been for you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Geraldine. Um, good to hear some thanks. Yeah. Uh, Nick, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I just want to make that comment as well, really. To, uh, that I, I've never had a, a bad experience in enforcement. Uh, it, it's, you have a, a, a remarkably difficult job where you, you, you can meet some very difficult characters who, uh, you know, people who've broken the law and want to carry on breaking the law, quite honestly. So it's, you, you've got a very hard job, and as far as I'm concerned, you do it very well uh, to the benefit of the community. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again from me. Um, so are there any additional 
recommendations or comments? If there isn't, I'm, I'm not in the mood to solutionize given Leslie already has an action plan. And it'd be good to, in the new term, see the, the fruits of the action plan going forward. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So we'll move on to the uh, next item um, with Elliot presenting. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was asked to come back to the panel again following my appearance in January to give a little bit more information about what the housing enforcement team does, um, in particular focusing on the housing health and safety rating system, or just HSSRS, um, and HMOs, and a little bit on outputs as well. Um, pretty fair to say that repairing obligations sit with landlords in the first instance, whether or not they're private sector or housing associations. Um, the housing health and safety rating system is a, a local authority tool which is set out in the Housing Act 2004, which is a risk-based approach to assessing issues that uh, arise in the private sector. Um, it is dependent on the households involved, and if perhaps one of the examples I usually give, if you can imagine you've got an open fire and you've got a household with children and one without children, the risks are quite different depending on that. So it is very much based on that. Um, Moving on briefly to houses in multiple occupation, that's a growing area for us. Um, there was a change in the law in 2018 that changed the definition, um, which meant that more uh, properties were pulled into that definition. And some of that's proactive investigation there as well, set out in the report that some of its intelligent base were very grateful for councillors and other people that put reports into the council and we do investigation of them individually. Lastly, I've put some, there was a request for outputs at the last meeting as well. Um, that's an area that we're working on to try and get some more information out of our IT systems. But I've set out there some of the statutory notices that have been issued uh, there as well. So just perhaps to finish up, to talk a little bit about the whole work of the section that, that is advertised quite prominently on the council's website. Certainly things like local solicitors, shelter, and uh, the Citizens Advice Bureau all know to report it to the council. Um, and equally, we get an awful lot from members of the public as well. So happy to answer any further questions you've got. Thank you very much. And uh, John, do you want to add anything at all? I go, brilliant, no worries. Um, open to panel, so Anthony, anyone else? Anthony. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report and, and bringing it to us. Um, really good to see a bit more information about what you do and how you do it. That's really useful. Um, I have two quick questions. Firstly, um, what prompts an inspection and, and perhaps what, what the total number of inspections in a year is? I don't think that's there, but maybe you don't have that figure. I'm not sure. My second question relates specifically to paragraph 2.8, um, which is about um, taking on cases of disrepair reported by tenants in uh, housing associations. And you mention the exception of the clear category one hazards. And I just wondered how, how you'd know um, is, is my question there. Thanks for those questions. Um, what prompts an investigation? Well, in the first instance, that mainly is driven by tenants coming to the council um, and or their advocates if they've got in touch with those. So those reports are, are usually made um, over the phone or by email. Uh, the previous report did have some of the inputs into the system. Um, I'd, I'd have to get the original report out, but there's some of the details in there. Uh, your second question relating to housing associations. Um, category ones have to be acted upon by the local authority. So in the majority of cases, we do go around and visit housing association ones where the tenants have contacted us. Now, we do also liaise with the housing associations very closely as part and parcel of that process. Um, so we do find in some situations it hasn't even been raised with the housing association and they haven't had an opportunity to go around and try and fix it. Um, but, you know, on occasion, if we have to serve notices, we will do, but we generally, it's a collaborative approach with the housing associations to try and resolve those properties, or those problems. And in most occasions, they're already underway with a plan which they can report back and we monitor the outcomes as well by talking to them. Geraldine, do you have a question? 
Um, no, thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, I've got a question, then we'll go to Nigel. I, I think we've all talked about this issue various times, and, and Nick's commented many times in his role as tennis champion, but also about the active role we all take when we go canvassing, when we do door knock and we see the issues. And no doubt you get the casework either from us directly or from Siobhan when it's a Mitchell and Morden um, um, case. I mean, what, what I like to understand is, because there are several times I've, I've door knocked on house, we've collected details, we've reported it, and the, the housing association or, or the private landlord hasn't taken that forward. How, how do you handle those cases? I appreciate that it's on a case by case, but can you give a general overview of your approach, given that you're right, you, you gain a lot more through carrot than a stick, um, and given the number of cases that you're getting is clearly going up as well? Okay, well, I mean, obviously, if those are reported, but I mean, I should have mentioned earlier on that I, we do get an awful lot of reports coming through from the tenants champion and also from um, local MPs as well. Um, if those cases are reported to us, we will take them up with the housing association, we will come around and have a look at those properties as well. And as you say, it, it is on an individual case basis, it's risk assessed. Um, and that's how we handle it. D does that answer the question? It kind of does, but it, it's more where if you look at your portfolio of, of cases you've got you know the, from here we won't and it, you, you'll rarely capture it perfectly in any report where do you look at the risk and how do you manage that risk because within there you've got as you say you've got cases that you submit to uh, landlords and they're on it you know sorry we'll fix it then you've got your persistent ones and then you've got your ones which, frankly, you know, you 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 just want to just go in there yourself and, and and sort it all out immediately. How are you managing that portfolio of risk, and how do you escalate that accordingly? Okay, well, it is very much based on the individual circumstances. I mean, we we do find that in some situations, well, only with private landlords today, that we've had to go in and do what something called works into full. That usually would be the last resort because obviously. We, the council would have to put a charge on the property in those circumstances. Um, but before that, there's very much a process of liaising with the landlord, be that private or otherwise, setting out uh, usually what's called a preliminary notice, which sets out category one and or category two hazards and a time scale with which to do that. That can also be followed up with a formal notice from there. So if you, you know, I think I've referenced the council's housing enforcement policy in there, that sets out in some quite detail how those things can proceed. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I, I uh, do, do, do with uh, when the, um, Cases on the um high um part um a uh, a uh, um area where there are some sh sh some you know um some leaf uh mold um damp rats and a a a a and I I find it um but um. So uh, that the um, housing uh, management um, claim um, they uh, seem to uh, take um, uh, weeks uh, or months to uh, deal, deal with, uh, with um, an um, issue if it, if it was in the, in, in the um, pop, Private uh, such such a uh, which 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 would have been done within a day, and I and I find that very uh, frustrating, and I feel for the um, people who uh, live live there. My um question is, do do you uh, work, work with some um, client if if, if if uh, yes, are you able to have much, um, you know, influence on on, on uh, them? Because in um, previous um, cases, 
and with our church, I'm, I'm sorry, we are Condi Moore extension on clay, and I find, you know, that's rather you know, frustrating. Thank you. Okay, I think it's probably worth pointing out that um, Clarion's one of 22 housing associations that operate in Merton, and uh, as well as, you know, and there's roughly 12,000 housing association properties versus about 28,000 private sector properties. So, you know, I think it's important to get that in context. And equally, it isn't all just about Clarion Housing Association. There are others that will sometimes will be reported to the council's housing enforcement service. Where that right that arises, we do get involved with the relevant housing association. We do raise it with them. We do go around and visit. Um, and, you know, it's a priority for us and we, we expect and we get feedback from those housing associations about what they intend to do and the timescales in which they would do it. Um, if you do have any sort of reports, if constituents come to you, please do raise it directly with me and we'll take it from there. Thank you. You've got that promise, Nigel. Um, okay. Unless there are any questions, uh, further questions, comments, I would like to close the, the meeting. We previously had a, several recommendations on this area and don't anticipate taking any further tonight. I need to say thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for those watching at home and uh, good evening. Thank you.